21st century. We recognize with Juneteenth being a federal holiday, there are a lot of festivities and uh, uh, celebrations as we think about Juneteenth, its history and meaning. But we also recognize that we can't lose sight of its importance historically in the current climate where we think about financial education, financial wealth, generational wealth, and voting participation. So we're excited to have this great conversation, talking a little bit about what does it mean when we think about money, power, respect in the 21st century. Uh, my name is Tom Sparrow, as I mentioned. I serve as the Director of Advocacy and Communications for the Urban League of Philadelphia, which is a 105-year-old direct service civil rights organization. And our work is to fight for those that are marginalized, helping them get into the middle class and beyond through economic empowerment and social justice. And we wanna thank our promotional partners that helped to execute this event, CHIP Professionals, Next Philadelphia, the Urban League of Philadelphia Young Professional Network, and the Urban League Guild of Philadelphia. And at this time, I wanna turn it over to our partner in executing this event, Kamika Grady, who will provide remarks on behalf of Lincoln Financial Group. Thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you for all the work that you've done to, to put this uh, important conversation together. And on behalf of Lincoln, we want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I, I echo Thomas's remarks. Uh, we want to make sure that as we approach Juneteenth and we celebrate um, this occasion that we're having important discussions so that we can um, continue to help serve our community. So thank you all for being here. Great. Thank you. And so at this time, we're going to have Ms. Kelsey Bradford, Bradbury, who serves as the Assistant Vice President of Market Intelligence and Thought Leadership at Lincoln Financial Group, provide a brief presentation on uh, financial health and financial wellness. And it's important that we kind of frame this panel conversation with some research so that we can uh, think about some of the historical data, what are some of the gaps that exist, and more importantly, how do we develop a plan moving forward? So um, Ms. Bradford, Berry in her role conducts research to understand attitudes, perceptions, and actions of consumers, advisors, employers, consultants, and brokers. And she's the primary architect of the Lincoln Retirement Power Study and Lincoln Consumer Sentiment Tracker, which examines U.S. consumers' motivations and behaviors as they spend, save, invest, and learn a plan for the future. So I want to thank Ms. Brad Berry for joining us this evening, and the floor is yours. Let me get your presentation up. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here today. I think this is a really important topic um, and really excited to kick off the conversation for our distinguished panelists and our speaker. And so I'm gonna get right into it because I know we have a lot on, on the docket today. So if you, we move forward one slide, on the left side of the screen, you'll see a variety of factors that really impact financial well being. And these are especially important when we look at race and ethnicity. And so you can see, you know, access to financial products, financial burdens that folks face, uh, cultural fluency of materials that are offered by financial services companies, generational wealth, financial literacy advice deserts or being able to access financial advice and income inequality are all really important factors to understand. Now I could be, you know, talking for two hours and cover each of these factors, but I want to just give a brief um, introduction to some of the data about income inequality, access to financial products, um, financial literacy and education, and advice deserts or access to advice and the impact that each of those uh, factors have on financial well-being. And I'm going to use throughout the next few slides, I'm going to provide some data specifically about retirement readiness just to really illustrate and show the impact of these systemic issues. So with that said, let's look at retirement readiness across rates and ethnicity, which you can see in the graph on the right side of the page. And as you can see, feelings of being prepared or ready for retirement are significantly lower in the Black community, with less than one in four saying that they feel their retirement savings is on track. And like financial well being, retirement readiness can be greatly impacted by each of the factors that are listed on the left side of the page. 
So let's jump right into those factors. On the next page, we will talk about how differences in income can greatly, greatly impact wealth accumulation. And so what I have on the screen here is the median weekly earnings of full-time workers across race and ethnicity. And this is fairly recent data. It's from fourth quarter of last year. And as we all know, there are well-reported large differences in salary across race and ethnicity and also across gender. And much research has been done to you know, unpack the cause of these gaps. And there's so many factors that play a part, um, including but not limited to occupation and industry, familial obligations, uh, labor force experience, education, and of course, societal factors. Now, when we compare across race, ethnicity, and gender, we see that Asian American men are the highest earning group with a median salary of $14.99 per week. And this is more than twice the median weekly income of the lowest earning group, which is Hispanic or Latinx women. And as you can see from the figures on this chart, an Asian American man earning the median income and contributing 15% of his income to a, a retirement plan in the workplace, which is generally, you know, the, the industry recommendation is to save 10 to 15% of your income for retirement. So that highest earning group saving 15% of the income at the median earning rate would save $11,692 annually for retirement. Now let's compare that to a uh, Hispanic or Latinx woman earning the median income and saving the same exact percentage of her income. She would save about $6,000 less in that same period. And in order to save the same as uh, someone at that higher earning, threshold, she would need to save more than 30% of her income to have the same account balance. So this really, you know, coupled with salary differences, we also see that women face costlier day-to-day I'm hearing someone might not be on me. Um, if we could maybe mute the line. You know what I just said? You know Jacob. She's been on my ass. Who's in the motherfucker? Okay, go on. Um, so I'm the median salary figures really I that name. Out the whole story. Um, there's really large variances in income and wealth across all segments. So, you know, these are just median numbers, but I think they really illustrate the impact of salary differences on the ability to accumulate wealth and to save for the future. And that ability to accumulate wealth, obviously on this slide, we're showing the hypothetical example of saving for retirement, but that impacts uh, across the board, the ability to save, plan for the future and uh, pass wealth on to future generations. So if we move on to the next slide, Access to, uh, to financial products and services really widens that financial well-being gap, especially when we look across race and ethnicity. And so here, again, we're using retirement savings as an example to really illustrate the differences in access. And you can see here, um, Black families are, you know, 56% are, have access to workplace retirement plan compared to 68% of Caucasian families. And 44% of Black families participate in that workplace plan. So it's a pretty high percentage of folks who have access who actually participate, which is a good thing. Um, but without access to a retirement savings plan at work, individuals are really losing out on a lot of benefits of those plans, such as automated savings. So it comes right out of your paycheck. You don't have to think about it. And also tax advantage growth within retirement savings plan in the workplace. And further building on that, the impact of COVID uh, had a, a disparate impact across race and ethnicity. So we saw that 36% of black consumers say that they or someone in their family was laid off or lost their job as a result of a pandemic. And again, that critically impacted not only ability to save, but also access to uh, 
products such as a retirement savings plan. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about financial literacy. So financial literacy scores are pretty low across all US adults of all race and ethnicities. But we see that financial literacy is particularly low um, among women, uh, Black and Hispanic consumers. And so you can see on the left side of the screen here that uh, the number of questions on average that folks got correct on a six question quiz and the quiz covered various investing uh, and saving topics. Basically how, you know, money can grow and, you know, impacts of interest rates and things like that. And what compounds the financial literacy um, concern is that there are a lot of programs that are being made available in the workplace. There's education that is being made available to um, younger folks in school. And there's a lot of that's being done to address this. However, at this point, uh, these financial wellness programs are not always resonating across race and ethnicity. So we can see that the percentage of folks who find financial wellness programs in the workplace to be very extremely useful is different across race and ethnicity, and that's on the right side of the page. And so the key takeaway there is, you know, as an industry, uh, we in financial services really need to do a better job of being culturally fluent and making sure that we're looking across all folks to understand what's needed and what will resonate when it comes to financial education. And on the next slide, we'll talk about those advice deserts. So again, um, the term that I'm using advice deserts is really about access to um, and availability of a financial advisor who someone trusts and, and feels comfortable going to. And so you can see on the far left side of the screen, there is different uh, levels of trust in financial advisors. And that's for a number of reasons, um, a lot of which have to do with sort of history of uh, feeling perhaps discriminated against uh, by financial services industry. And you can see that the trust levels are pretty low in particular in the black community. And then when you look at representation among financial advisors, you can see that, and that's in the middle part of the screen, you can see that is really adding to uh, a lack of trust. So women, um, Hispanic and black folks are very underrepresented in the population of US advisors. So that is really only compounding sort of the lack of trust, lack of access, and uh, if we can encourage more diversity within the advisor population, I think that will go a long way in really serving the needs of various communities. And then finally, you can see, again, I used retirement as an example, but you can see that folks who are retirees are not using financial advisors consistently when we look across race and ethnicity. So white folks are much more likely to be using financial advisors when we compare to um, Hispanic and black community. And so to finish out on the next page, I wanted to leave you with this framework to really address financial well-being. So as an industry, I think we focus a lot on the behaviors that folks are taking. So we say, you know, folks should start to save early. They should save 10 to 15% of their income, uh, invest in a diversified portfolio, you know, avoid taking on too much debt, uh, invest in certain products, seek financial advice. And we try to track and influence those behaviors and educate around those behaviors to really drive financial well being. And I think we've done as an industry a good job of identifying positive behaviors and striving to build education and tools to really address those behaviors. But what we 
can do more right now, I think, is these items that come before behavior in this framework. So doing more to address and understand the social and economic environment, uh, personality and attitudes, decision context, you know, how a particular decision is presented, uh, knowledge and skills, and in particular, available opportunities. So I think this framework is a really good way to think about how we can do a better job of understanding all consumers and in particular, you know, the black community by understanding all the factors that can ultimately influence behaviors and financial well-being. And so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to our panel to have a, a full discussion. Great. Thank you, Kelsey, for that presentation. I appreciate you framing the conversation um, and helping us kind of think through the data and what are some of those challenges. So now we're gonna turn over to our panel. Uh, we have a panel of professionals that will bring this conversation much more um, intimate as we think about possible solutions, but then also the intersection when we think about financial health and wellness, but also civic participation and civic engagement and how having uh, more uh, stronger financial um, literacy knowledge, stronger financial health can impact your ability to be more civically engaged, more be more powerful. And when you think about politics and when you think about uh, political engagement, the intersection of financial health and financial um, well-being and civic engagement. <clears throat> so I want to thank um, our panelists. Our first panelist is Dana Wilson. She's a diversity and inclusion award winner who has been named one to watch in FinTech for Money um, 2020. And she's a 2021 trailblazer for, from Black women in media and an experienced financial professional with over 15 years in the financial service industry. Um, she is the founder and CEO of CHIP, which is known as Changing How Individuals Prosper, a B2B financial service marketplace that makes it easier to find Black and Latinx uh, financial professionals. We also want to thank um, Kamika Brady, who serves as the Assistant Vice President in Marketplace and Community Diversity for uh, Lincoln Financial Group. We appreciate her stepping in on short notice. Um, we recognize one of our uh, uh, previous panelist uh, was under the weather, so we appreciate Kamika stepping in. We also have City Commissioner Omar Sabir. You may have seen him throughout uh, the last 2020 election, protecting our right, protecting our democracy. He serves as the City Commissioner for the City of Philadelphia. So anything around voting and elections, he, along with two other City Commissioners, execute voting, um, the voting process, and voting counting here in the City of Philadelphia. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening. The first question, um, I wanna to go to you, Dana. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest financial obstacles that individuals face given this current climate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Kelsey brought up some really great points earlier around all of the statistics around kind of how we got here and, and why. But I think the biggest things, especially where we are now, given the current environment, is really understanding what to believe, right? That's the first part of it. I mean, we can look at the statistics all day, but a lot of it is just human beings and naturally trying to figure out where we fit in this financial of society is understanding where to go and who do we really believe, right? We're seeing all different types of stuff in the news that kind of scares us on a day-to-day -day basis, probably second by second, right? It's just that what to do, how to do it, you know, do I pull my money out of the market? Because, you know, everyone's talking about how bad things are now and how bad things continuously might progress, right? Um, you know, we're looking on social media and we're seeing all the different, almost kind of scare tactics that happen there, right? Whether it's people we know sharing stuff or people we don't know. And again, that constant active engagement um, within the media. But a lot of it is really going back to self, uh, understanding your own financial goals and, and what risk you feel like you need to take, um, you know, your ability to save. Should you be kind of doubling down on, you know, 
ensuring that you have a lot more income in your savings accounts or in your investment accounts. I know a lot of times it seems very scary where we feel like we need to rush and pull money out of places, but sometimes it's not necessarily the smartest thing to do, even when it seems like we're in times of defeat or panic, right? So again, it's kind of going back to who you are with your money, um, who you are and what your, what your goals are and how you're trying to save, uh, what your life looks like and really understanding Kind of that process of the plan that you put together either by yourself or with possibly with your financial professional and understanding you know how you're being more prepared for times like this because the one thing that we do know is this isn't going to be the last time we step into some sort of recession right this is more than likely going to happen again at some later period uh, but if you understand your unique goals, if you kind of try to source out um, information that's continuously coming from the news and social media and just kind of take some steps back again into what your own personal financial journey is, you can kind of start to overcome a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in unfortunate situations that are going that that is going on right the rise in gas prices is real i live in uh, northern new jersey so i think we're at the top i actually think we're winning right now in this uh, competitive environment of gas prices uh, but it's all about you know planning and saving and knowing that hey i need to either double down on things that i'm going uh, things that i'm doing and making sure that my money is making sense uh, for me and ensuring that, hey, I'm, I'm able to live off my, my means, right? That's something that we don't always necessarily do in, in all communities, and, but specifically sometimes in, in our community. Great, and I think that's something that is critical when we think about those challenges, because I think the, you know, this current climate has put a lot of pressure on folks to kind of think differently about their money and think about some of their, uh, I don't want to say not habits, but like things that they would do rather they're thinking about the last lunch that they buy or do they not go to work because they want to save gas and some of those things. So then Kamika, when I think about that and when we think about naturally some of the cultural norms that exist among people of color, right? I think there's always that notion of like, especially in, when times are rough, um, African-Americans and other marginalized, particularly African-Americans are able to do more with less and are able to hunker down you know, some of the cultural norms of like, if times are rough, we're going to make it work with our ramen noodles, or we're going to make it work for our PB&Js or our bologna sandwiches, some of the challenges and some of the norms that like, when times are rough, we know that we can kind of tackle it, right? But there are some norms that exist that, that are now could potentially be heightened in this recession, because there is that sense of fear and that sense of how do, what, what's the other side? So how do we think about some of these cultural norms and how do we break those norms um, when we think about our money? Great question, Thomas. And it's a really important uh, question uh, to answer. And I think part of what we need to do is begin to have these conversations. Um, I think, you know, this conversation started off with Kelsey's presentation and looking at the data and looking at the numbers and really trying to understand what our barriers are as a community is the first step in, in us breaking some of those cultural norms. You know, she shared a lot of information with us and that's why I'm so happy that we're having this conversation because we're all pretty much aware of the challenges and, and of the barriers, right, that she shared. A lot of that information wasn't necessarily new to us. We may not have seen it in that format. We may not have known a number or a statistic, but a lot of that information isn't new to us. And so the more we can start to talk about it and have these conversations and talk about solutions and work with uh, professionals, right? One of the things that she highlighted was the trust. We know that there's a trust issue in our community specifically, and we know that there are reasons for those trust issues that are historical and systemic, but we have to begin to break those barriers and have uncom uncomfortable conversations so that we can uncover real solutions to, to help us move forward. Well, thank you, and as we... Um invite Commissioner Sabir to uh, join us on the screen. Dana, I want to go to you about that part. How do we have these conversations? You know, folks don't, you know, when we think about money, folks are very skeptical. Folks are always nervous in terms of family members getting in our business, worrying about who's who's counting my coins when we think about, you know, um, you know, when we think about um, money and when we think about trying to protect that money. How can families have these conversations, right? Well, um, you know, we see sometimes in society when folks are not um, prepared, prepared 
financially, they have to kind of consider other means, you know, when people die, we got to consider GoFundMe's, or we, we don't consider some of these tools that exist that allow us to build generational wealth. And many times because we don't want to have those conversations on the front end, because we're scared people's in our business. So um, Dana, how do you encourage folks to kind of have these conversations around money when folks feel, feel like it's not really a comfortable topic? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not comfortable and it's it's not a sexy topic to talk about, right? But it but it should be and money should be fun. And you have to kind of go through this path of I think some some bit of being self-aware financially, um, taking back ownership and not letting your money take control of you. And sometimes that's the first place to start is with yourself. Because if you're not necessarily comfortable with having the conversation or just facing your financial feel fears. It's going to be tough to do that with your friends, with your community, with your close family. And once you kind of can get past that, you can really start to just unpack that conversation. Because, you know, for all the trauma that we've had to deal with, just as Black people living and trying to exist um, in America and then trying to exist here financially, you know, we, we've been beaten up a lot. And there's a lot of reasons why we don't like to have these conversations because we've been taught not to, right? So now we have to unlearn a lot of the things that we've been taught and not having these conversations and not sharing information because us not sharing information is not going to help us to get past further uh, individually or with our families. So it's time when we're together to really just sit down and have that talk with mom, have that talk with dad, have we talk with them as a couple. Um, have those talks with your friends, even if you're single, you're, you're not married, you're not in a, in a partnership, you know, who are those people that you can navigate the financial world with so that you can start to have those transparent conversations, because it's also not just about death, right, the more we're transparent in our conversations, the more money we make, the more successful we are, when other people know how much you're making, they can say, hey, girl, so-and-so was actually paying me this much to do this or speak at this engagement, or, hey, I was offered this um, letter by applying to this company. I think you should go back and reneg renegotiate that. But you don't have that power to take it back if we don't start to have those conversations. And of course, it's even worse in our communities when we're talking about, you know, death and, and having to experience that. And I'm sure we've all been there. I've, I've been there, right, where family members don't necessarily have things set up properly and you have to step in uh, financially to either take on that burden or figure out how you're going to crawl out of that hole. And it's not a good place to be in because you either didn't have the conversation or didn't want to, or were scared to, or again, was worried about someone being all up in our business, right? We don't have the luxury of, of going forward with that. You know, we're here not necessarily to talk about the past and the history and how we got here, but really solutions on our path forward. And a lot of that is championing each other to do better championing each other to create those safe spaces to talk, right? Even within your group of friends or your family, making people feel comfortable to know that, hey, like it's not about this hierarchy of what you make and what I make. It's about how can I help to propel you forward? How can you teach me something about maybe something that you're doing financially that might make sense for me as well? But again, also realizing what your goals and capabilities and strategies is for your life and for your family. But it's a tough conversation, but it's not that difficult to get started. It's just a matter of really sitting down um, and doing it out of love, right? This is a love conversation. This is a conversation in the same way we tell people that we love them, do the same thing financially, because that's what we're here to protect, right? We're here to protect our legacy. Um, as family members, we're here to protect our legacy um, as just a Black community. No, definitely, definitely. And we asked the audience, um, as you are hearing this conversation, feel free to add your questions to the chat and we can make sure to try to address them towards the end because there's a lot of great insight that's being shared. Uh, so Kamika, I know you are working at Lincoln Financial Group um, and you all have been committed to this issue and committed to understanding holistically how do we think about wealth. Uh, are you able to elaborate a little bit more on like how you all kind of internalize intergenerational wealth when we think about marginalized communities or when we think about special communities, you know, selfishly going to think about the African-American community when we think about generational wealth, which is something that is critical to the Urban League of Philadelphia when we think about our legacy and the impact that we've had here in Philadelphia uh, since 1917. It's all about getting folks into the middle class and beyond in those traditional American pillars of um, homeownership, uh, 
jobs and small business, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what, what, what is Lincoln Financial doing right now to think about generational wealth by African-Americans? Great question, Thomas. Thank you. And, and to be quite honest, Lincoln is doing a lot. And I'm very proud to be a part of Lincoln because of the commitment uh, that the organization is making uh, to, to diverse multicultural markets into the Black uh, community in general. So one of the things I, I have to take this opportunity to highlight is um, I joined the organization and, and the first thing I really wanted to do and was tasked with was un deciding where or, or uncovering where are we. So working closely with our consumer insights group to say, hey, who are our customers, right? What percentage of our clients are Black? What percentage of our clients are Hispanic? And that was an a eye-opening exercise for many leaders in our organization because, to be quite honest, we have work to do. And we're committed to doing that work. So one of the first things we did was we actually partnered with Dana and her organization, Chip Professionals. We have a network of African-American financial professionals and we wanna support them. We wanna support them in the community so that they can uh, help uh, people along their journeys. And so Dana actually has a platform where she connects uh, black and brown consumers directly with black and brown financial profession professionals. And so that was one of the first things that, that we wanted to be a part of uh, with that partnership. And then in terms of the other things that Lincoln is doing, there's a long list uh, and possible to list all of them. But one, we have a, a, a foundation. We have a Lincoln Foundation. Our executive director is actually on this call, Megan Wright, and she's uh, responsible for us actually having this conversation today. So our foundation is committed to supporting organizations that support our communities. But then aside from that and the great work that they do, we have a um, mentoring program for high school students. We have a mentoring program for early career uh, individuals so that as they're growing their careers, they're also learning about the importance of financial literacy and financial wellness and how to build their own financial uh, futures. We have um, a program where we support minority businesses. I'm actually responsible for helping to uh, expand our supplier diversity program where we support minority businesses um, to, to grow their businesses and to be able to supply their products to other businesses. Um, investments, we're looking at everything holistically um, from an investment standpoint to make sure that we're making responsible, socially responsible investments to help um, communities. And one of the um, really awesome things we just did was we donated $10 million to a opportunity fund that's focused on providing affordable housing. So we're ensuring that the investments that fuel our life insurance products and retirement products are socially responsible and that they actually support the black community uh, in general. So that's just a list, a small list, one other thing I like to mention, because we might not think about this when we think about inter intergenerational wealth, but uh, Lincoln is also making sure that we have minority representation and leadership. So we actually looked at the demographics of our organization, and we actually have leadership targets in every area of our business so that we're providing career opportunities and career growth for um, people who work in our organization. So I think that's really important because Income, uh, as we saw, is a really important factor that can help fuel your um, your financial success. Well, that's interesting. That's pretty uh, comprehensive. Really, um, it's really uh, impressive to see the amount of commitment that um, Lincoln and Financial is making in terms of this issue, in terms of uplifting Black professionals, and then also thinking about generational wealth. Uh, so, Dana, when we think about those steps on an institutional level. Let's take it back to individual levels. What are some of the strategic steps that you would recommend people begin to take when they think about maximizing their income? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the, the biggest thing, and I think Kelsey actually um, mentioned this before, part of it, it's it's being realistic, but then also automate as much as possible. I was really excited um, that she used that word automate because sometimes it's easier when we can just set it and forget it, right? So whether that's, you know, your bill pay, whether that's, you know, you know dumping money from uh, your checking account or wherever your direct deposit goes into and it automatically pulling back into your saving, your money market. I know a lot of institutions and companies, wherever you have your 401k, you can roll that directly uh, in there, right? And then also from your outside investments account, some that you can tie directly to your savings accounts or even split within your paycheck. So if you're not doing that now, definitely look into your company and say, how can I easy, easier automate um, and move my money around so that I know that I'm doing that. So whatever shows up in your checking account, 
is literally the money that you have to spend, right? That is actually um, your discretionary income and everything else has been taken account for. So you putting away your savings, you making your investments in your 401k or other retirement plans, and then any other investment uh, opportunities that you might have, you're doing that, you know, without even having to think about it. And then kind of going over uh, that monthly or however you want to do that. I am a spreadsheet geek and nerd and, and that's just my thing right so I think finding whatever works for you I have a very uh detailed spreadsheet <laughs> if most people saw it they'd probably freak out and I don't think you have to get that granular but I think it's something just know what works for you right if it's using utilizing a spreadsheet or some type of app or is it you know kind of a combination of those things utilize whatever works and continue to work it if it's pen and pad journaling like don't be embarrassed about, you know, bringing out your financial journal, right? Or whatever those books that you keep, if that is working for you, work it. Don't get so caught up in all this technology that you have to have. You can also just set simple reminders on your phone that remind you to enter things um, into your journal. It's also about paying down debt, right? And making sure that you're closely monitoring that. You know, this is not necessarily the time to be spending unless you can truly afford it, right? And afford comes through a multitude of things, right? Yes, you can buy it, but are you sacrificing something, especially in this moment that you really need, which is more of the word affording it in its totality? Yes, you can buy it, but should you buy it, right? And really having those self-check-ins. It's almost similar to how on our phones when we're driving, now you can have it pop up and tell people automatically, hey, I'm driving and you're not touching your phone, right? Have something like that in place for yourself, just as reminders. Um, have your accountability team. I think that's important. And your accountability team should be those financial professionals, your financial professional team. So whether that's your financial advisor, your accountant, your tax professional, your state attorney, um, your wealth planner, your, you know, that CFP professional and understanding that these can be separate people um, and what those individuals bring to the table and how they're communicating with people can really determine your outgoing financial outlook. Uh, and then, you know, just the system or the just the area that we're in right now, which is, you know, not panicking, right? Again, I talked a little bit about this earlier. Yes, we're in a time of kind of unknown and, and possibly chaos as well, uh, but don't necessarily just start making rash, de rash decisions when it comes to your investments. Really think back to your plan, your goal, and your strategy. Um, and make sure everything is aligning. So whether that's rebalancing your portfolio, working with your advisor or your professional to do so, um, you know, taking those steps back if you feel like your uh, retirement plan might be a little bit too aggressive for you in this moment, do those self check-ins uh, and make sure you're doing that. And understand that people are still making money right now, right? Not everyone is necessarily, um, you know, going broke and running rampant. So know that you can still be in a place to receive and make money as well. Definitely, definitely. And I think it's really important to think about accountability teams because um, that extends itself when we think about politics and political engagement, right? Because what we, when we talk about advocacy and when we talk about civic engagement, there is this tendency to think that you have to go at it alone. And, you, and then there's this feeling that I, as one individual, have to be concerned with all these issues that exist and not recognize that there's opportunities to spread the wealth as it relates to building a team of individuals that can look at different issues uh, that, are part, that are important to you and your family and assign people specific tasks. So one person could be the education expert, one person could be the environmental health expert, one person could be the small business expert. And as you are analyzing the policies, you are able to then assess how candidates are um, doing or um, all performing in those tasks. So when we think about accountability in this financial health, it's that same kind of um, trend. You want to build a team of individuals that are, are people that you trust, people of individuals that have a certain level of expertise, but then opportunities where individuals have different knowledges and skill sets. When we think about uh, building um, you know, investment clubs and when we think about retirement clubs and when we think about all these different ways that folks can build wealth together, there's opportunities where best practices, best practices can be shared and teams can assess what's happening in certain industries financially, what markets are growing up and down and use these teams together. So I think there's always that sense of regardless of um, 
when you think about politics or when you think about civic engagement, when you think about financial, it's really about building teams and working together to ensure that um, you all have common goals and a common interest. So Dana, I wanna go back to you a little bit if you don't mind. You talked a little bit about um, wealth building and folks working together to build that wealth. I wanna pivot a little bit. What are some of the trends that exist? Um, what are some emerging trends in wealth building that are gaining traction that communities need to be mindful? Um, I know there's always, you know, I know you talked about people are making money right now, right? So in this recession, there are still people out there that's making money. Are there new trends that people are looking into as it relates to wealth building that you think communities of color need to, you know, take a step back and research a little bit, kind of see if it's a space for them to be comfortable. I know there's always talks about new forms of money and new forms of um, uh, uh, income and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes it's not always new trends, right? We're always looking for that new thing and that new pop up, right? Everyone's all taken back on the different currencies and crypto and, and all of the things that kind of make fintech what it what it has been, right? Or, or what it's coming to be. And this is kind of that next wave. But even with new trends, you still have to understand that they're new, right? And there's a lot of people who are, you know, have coined themselves as these kind of crypto experts and experts in this, but you have to recognize that it's really hard to be an expert that in something that has kind of been around uh, for about three or so days, right? If we want to kind of look at it in a granular perspective. So you want to just kind of tailor your expectations and keep that in mind and understand that everything that's new can also come with risk, right? Not that you shouldn't kind of dip your toe in it to understand, educate yourself. Absolutely. You know, this is a time um, where we can have greater access to access to things that are new and developing, and we should absolutely be at the table, but also understanding does that table make sense for what you're trying to do right now? And how does that fit into a part of your legacy and your strategy and making sure that you're not putting everything into that specific table or new trend um, because it may, may or may not make sense for you in this moment, right? That doesn't mean stay away um, from, you know, different types of currencies or NFTs and stuff like that, but just understanding that you want to um, speak with someone or kind of do your own research and due diligence. Don't get so caught up in all of the people making large sums of money online because you don't know what's happening behind that, right? So it's not always about the new trends. Sometimes it's the old trends and the things that you're not doing now, right? Are you maxing out your 401k? Are you maxing out um, your IRAs, if you're able to um, establish one of those, are you using everything to your benefit, like your health savings accounts? Like these are all things that aren't necessarily new, but still trends that we haven't fully adopted as a culture and as a community. You know, there's a lot of different vehicles that have been in existence for some times that we aren't necessarily utilizing to our advantage, especially if you're a small business owner. There's so many things to continuously talk about, like your solo 401ks. Um, that you can have more of a um, contribution status if you have your sole business, if you're a solo entrepreneur or business owner. Um, understanding like there's so many different types of tax advantages that you can take advantage of as a business owner and making sure that you're utilizing those things to your advantage first. Why, yes, also staying knowledgeable about things that are going on within the market and trends to be adopted. And, and, you know, in times like this, I think it's paying attention to uh, companies that seem to be doing bad, right? Because again, people are still making money and you don't want to be afraid that, hey, I need to pull my money out of here because this stock price has dropped, right? Well, guess what? For you pulling it out, there's a bunch of people who are doubling down. Um, but again, a lot of that is, does that make sense for you in this moment? What are you trying to accomplish financially, not just now, but in the future? And how do those things line up? So with all the new trends, there's still the old trends of maximizing your savings, your retirement, your outside investments, ensuring that you have a will, possible trust set up. And these are things that are not for the ultra wealthy and the wealthy, right? These are things for you. Um, and that's a lot of why, you know, I started CHIP and, you know, the shameless plug there, but is people to understand that wealth is for you. There is a financial professional that can help you along your journey. And it's important that you kind of take step one before we keep trying to jump um, to step 13. Definitely, definitely. I want to bring Commissioner Omar Sabir to this conversation a bit when we, and shift a little bit when we think about 
uh, politics, right? Because in this, you know, you and I have been out in the community trying to get folks registered to vote. And we know that there's this growing perception that like politics is too difficult, too ineffective, and Black folks need to just focus on making the money, right? Everyone's like, nah, just secure the bag, take care of all that financial wealth and make sure that your family's all set. But seeing the disconnect between making money and, and political engagement and being an engaged voter, why is it critical for urban communities to lean in, not only when we think about financial health, when we think about money, but let's think about that title, Mighty Power, which when we think about politics, it's all about power and respect for Black communities. Why is it important that African Americans lean in in politics just as much as when we think about just financial education? Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, for having this uh, event. And I think when we think about uh, politics, you know, that's all politics is about money. Uh, if you look at uh, our governor, he's a billionaire. You know, most, governor, most uh, governors are billionaires. Uh, most uh, United States senators uh, have uh, assets of over uh, at least a million dollars. You look at the uh, financial disclosures. And sometimes we tend to try to separate the two items, but they're all sort of like one and the same. And if even if you're looking at just from a, just, just from like a little smaller level, right? You know, if you have all the money in the world, you want to build a building, you have to go through zoning. And so if you can't get your building zoned, you can't build it no matter how much money you have. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to look at, uh, you want to do a certain transaction, you may need someone to have a certain license or there may be a certain regulation that may stop you from doing it. So it's all kind of one and the same. And we also have to consider as well that when we're talking about our savings that and our expenses, that we also want to fund whatever candidates has your interest. Because it's one thing to vote, it's another thing to get registered. Then also in your financial sort of planning, you also should have uh, political uh, contributions uh, involved inside of your budget. Because uh, if you look at uh, the mayor of Philadelphia, it typically costs between 400,000 to $1 million uh, to be a mayor, to be a city council person, it costs uh, 300,000, 400,000. To be a state senator, you need about 100,000 to 300,000. A district attorney, 100,000 to 300,000. Uh, city commissioners, in my position, it's uh, 100,000 to 200,000, but that number actually, it's went up. It's like 250,000, almost $400,000. Uh, Register of Wills Office, 100,000, 200,000, same thing with the sheriff. I mean, you know, it, it, you can't escape it, right? And so we have to, you know, have more intelligent conversations like this. And I think we need to do it uh, more uh, often uh, to really kind of line everything down because even if you get the money, if you don't have the political sort of help or influence, you're not going to be able uh, to function to even move whatever idea uh, that you want. Uh, there's also contracts that's awarded uh, by the city, by the state. Uh, Philadelphia has over $3 billion uh, budget. And so we spend uh, $3 billion. I mean, even our department, we have a $22 million budget. You know, you talk about 800000 over $2 million, just in certain contracts. I mean, we just purchased uh, some electronic poll books software uh, for $6 million. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we actually have about, and our goal is to have about 30% of that going to uh, minority participation. Uh, but it's so much um, uh, work and it, and it all works hand to hand and it's all about information. And I think when people want to see us, and I'm talking about us and we, I'm talking about African-Americans, I think uh, we try to separate us and say things like, you know, people are actually spending money and fake robot profiles telling people not to vote and be involved in just the business. You know, that's, that's how sophisticated the disinformation. So a lot of that information that we're hearing, Thomas, is people that actually pay uh, social media firms, to look at these profiles and even hear some of the disunion that we have. And then, you know, uh, they run with it. 
So, I mean, politics, money, power, it's all part of being a citizen. It's all about citizenship. And that's the kind of the way that we have to tend to look at things. Because once you make one political contribution, once your name is in a uh, the list for a donor, you're gonna start receiving sort of information that a lot of people typically don't. And what happens is you're gonna be on this call list and the people are gonna call you up and ask you a question and say, hey, you can donate to my campaign. And you can say, hey, you know, what are you running for? Who are you? And then they're gonna give you a spill, tell you what their platform are, and you're gonna have access. And if anyone doesn't believe me, I mean, whatever candidate, again, this is not partisan. If you give $10 to some campaign, you're gonna start receiving texts and emails, depending on how much you donate. But if you give anything, you're gonna start receiving sort of information that's gonna start coming to you. The same exact way as if you're a super voter, there's gonna be campaigns and things like that. People wanna start communicating and talking to you. So, you know, being a productive citizen is contact sport. And we have to begin to sort of uh, embrace uh, sort of that whole uh, sort of uh, idea. But everything is politics. Uh, you know, there's every some sort of regulation. There's always something. And then um, another thing you gotta look at too is let's just say, for example, that you fulfill uh, your contract uh, with the city or with the state. And let's just say, you know, the pay is from 30 days to 45 days for you to get uh, your payment. If you're a small business, you know, you have to wait. You, you're a rented service and you have to wait, you know, for the resources for you to come. And elected officials can push that, you know, sort of thing and say, hey, wait a minute, this business hasn't been paid. And somebody there by your side is calling calling up, seeing exactly what's going on to try to get you paid. And if you don't have that sort of uh, political uh, sort of uh, connection, you have to keep waiting sometimes to get uh, your money and it's shameful. But that's just the way how life uh, sort of operates. I mean, even if you want uh, sort of services with your school and education, even with the school district, I mean, you might call the school district up, try to get some sort of results. But if you call an elected official, he makes that call on your behalf or she makes that call on your behalf. You know, things are going to run a lot smoother. So we have to begin to not look at things like we're outsiders. We're insiders, we're taxpaying citizens. And this is what we deserve. But it has to be everything. I mean, it's voting, it's political uh, contributions, it's everything. And we want our fair share of the uh, American dream. We're entitled to it and we deserve it. Yeah, and I think that's important. Um, uh, before we pivot, Kamika, to, uh, to a question to you, I want to, uh, Commissioner Sabir, I want to go into one. Uh, additional question. I know one of the phrases that you always talk about, and I believe Senator Hughes is always the, um, I believe is the originator of this phrase, is ballot behavior shapes policy decisions, right? So when we think about um, how politicians pay attention to- Hold on, hold on, Thomas, hold on, hold on, Thomas. I, I, I was the originator. Oh, you're the originator? Oh, I'm sorry, my fault. I was the originator. You're the originator. Yeah, my we can fault. Tell so, me, yeah. so with that, knowing that that's your phrase, so then tell us a little bit more about why that is something that you constantly talk about and when you're doing your engagement, right? Because you're talking about um, individuals paying attention to, like elected officials paying attention to who donates, elected officials paying attention to votes. Like that's how candidates know who to kind of listen to. That's a little bit of that dirty secret is that they pay attention to who votes, not who exists. So when we think about that uh, ballot behavior shapes policy decision, why is that something that you constantly one that you created, but two, constantly champion when we think about uh, political engagement. Well, so it's, it's very simple, right? I mean, we got to really think, right? The way how campaigns, and I think with technology, it's another way that we have to look at the way how they do campaigns now. Uh, for example, uh, if someone wants to be a mayor, they may hire a firm and they say, okay, you want to be mayor. You know, pay me all this, this money. And then they're going to say, OK, well, OK, you want to be mayor, we'll make you mayor. And the campaigns now, what they do is they identify voters, which they believe can vote for you to get you your vote count, whatever it is. It might be 30,000 votes. 
It might be 40,000 votes, it might be whatever that number is. They come up with this number and say, okay, here's what we think of the voters that's gonna support you. And then what they ask those, that list, they poll them, they do data, they do research, ask them what's your top three issues. And whatever those top three issues are is what's gonna be the, uh, the campaign message. It's not even really gonna be a candidate. You know, that's, that's the way how they do it now. And um, when you look at some of the policies that we see, sometimes we really wonder in our head, like, why do we, why, why are we hearing all these issues? And uh, I gave you one example, uh, and you see right now with Councilman Johnson's district, there's this big fight about bike lanes. I mean, it's this big thing about like bike lanes, right? And so when you got violence, you got crime in his district, is it's mixed. It's like part gentrified, it's mainly African-Americans, right? And it's a funny district because you have some people that's living, uh, you know, below the poverty line, but then right next door, you may have someone that has a million dollar house. And so we start, the, the more affluential you are, you participate in the process typically. And, you know, you're seeing people going back and forth, but they're trying to push bike lanes in this district. And so dog parks and things like that. I mean, that's that's something that your local elected officials starting to hear about. And so if he's trying to come up with, or she's trying to come up with certain policies, these people are yelling, screaming, we want this, we want that. That's gonna shape his policy. Bike lanes and dog parks might not be the top of his priority for his district. You got violence, you got other things, but if they're shaping that policy and say, hey, we want bike lanes, we don't care about the violence. We don't care about this shooting. It's not important to us. We want bike lanes. It puts them in a sort of, you know, tough uh, position. And that's just one way, you know, from sort of a local level. If you look at the federal level, when you talk about the lobbyists at NRA and the way how they position themselves uh, with these elected officials on the federal side, you know, there's like people not moving. You know, we talk about gun safety, uh, about gun reform. And it's staying basically the same place, you know, and they fight and they fighting, but the NRA is pushing it and these lobbyists as well, they calling up the voters to asking them to call their elected officials and send them letters, send them emails, and it's constantly shaping policy over and over again. But here's the thing, we don't have to feel uh, powerless about it, right? There's still enough people, uh, in America uh, to, to actually uh, make some change because most Americans don't vote on a consistent basis. They only vote on a presidential election. So if you can get, you know, 500 to 1,000 voters about any issue, and we're talking about grassroots organization, getting them more involved in politics, you can shape almost any policy. You know, and, and, and believe it or not, you know, your average, a uh, council person may only receive 10 to 15 calls a day. And Philadelphia is one of the largest uh, cities, but even as large as we are, a district office may only get, you know, 20, 30, 40 calls sometimes, depending on the day. And so we have to understand that, you know, we do have uh, leverage. It's not uh, hopeless. Uh, but again, it shapes policy. You know, the more we vote, um, the more we get. And when you're looking at a map, and when you're saying, okay, you know, how do we sort of navigate uh, to make our decisions? You know, uh, you'll start to see that violent behavior uh, plays a major part. Uh, one of the things that I observed during the pandemic was when the trash collection uh, was, was going to be moving slow, move slower. And there were some areas in the city that trash was sitting out for days and days and days at a time. And then there was other areas in the city that their trash was picked up uh, quicker. And it was shameful is that the areas that trash wasn't picked up was areas that didn't really uh, fully participate. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to uh, you know, analyze these things and constantly have that sort of communication uh, uh, with our family and friends. And even just growing up, I mean, me and myself, I'm a product of the uh, Philadelphia School District. I'm a graduate uh, out of Philadelphia School District. 
uh, graduated from Cheney. And I, I believe that, and I have children inside the Philadelphia School District myself, but I think the school district has changed. I mean, I think the school district uh, has, you know, but if you look at the vote totals when I was younger growing up, they were actually higher. So we had, you know, like better schools. But now we start to see our voter turnouts decline through the years. We started seeing us lose uh, over $1 billion when uh, Governor Corbett was in office. And in that time, we saw a 9% voter turnout in 2013. And next year, we lost a billion dollars. Governor Tom Wolf, he, he'd been trying to put the billion dollars back and he'd been adding it in, but we're still you know, a billion dollars short. We lost a billion dollars. And so that's detrimental to already a poor a school district. And, you know, it, it happens, you know, and, and we have to, like I said, keep on increasing our turnout. You now, flip side, what we saw in 2020, right? That part was so elect so, so important. We saw government give back unprecedented money to the citizens. Uh, don't, don't, don't we, and we ever know in, our, in the history of our country, that pandemic money, that PP money, all that money that came out, it was an election year. You know, they gave out all that money so that, you know, it was a very important election. And we know that that changed even some people's uh, lifestyles. And so you saw one of the highest uh, turnouts in history of uh, elections, you know? And so, because people felt, you know, the power uh, from the government, they said, hey, man, you know, I need to be involved in it. And so, you know, as we move uh, forward, we definitely want to try to develop, you know, policies that affect people. And then also, we also can look from a historical perspective too of all the things that have been, sometimes we take things for granted, like the LAHI program, the USAF program, all these different programs that have been helping us for years. A lot of times we don't really equate that to uh, a political uh, sort of decision. And, you know, definitely. we have to keep on working. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. And um, so when we, you know, um, there's definitely a point where we think about just those connections between how government works and more so how government can pay attention to data to then think about new policies. Like the census is a perfect example that census data is how government figures out if a new health system goes in one neighborhood or not, or if a new building comes in a, in a neighborhood or not. So all this participation is how you let your government know that you are here, that you exist, and that you're present. So Kamika, as we close out, I want to have one final question to you, because we know that in this great pivot or great resignation, I know there's a lot of different terms that exist when we think about this current climate where folks are looking for a new job, looking for a new industry to kind of go into. Are there certain skills that you believe people need? And let's say people wanted to go and become your colleague over at Lincoln Financial and they wanted to enter the financial service sector. Are there certain skills or certain trans, you know, transferable skills or certain things that they should consider if they kind of want to pivot into this role? Thank you, Thomas. Great question. And I'm just really learning and actually enjoying this conversation. And uh, I really appreciate what the commissioner was saying. When I think about Lincoln, we actually have a lot of employees who are active uh, in politics, some who actually serve, um, which I think is really important. And so that kind of ties into your question because there is a direct connection and uh, organizations like Lincoln recognize that and encourage that. Um, we encourage voter participation um, because we know that it that it is important. And so from a um, industry standpoint, in terms of jobs and careers, the, the good news is that there are tons of opportunities and tons of jobs. There are transferable skills. Many people like me start out in financial services and I, I didn't intend to go in, into financial services. I didn't graduate with a finance degree. So you don't need a finance degree. Um, I think if you wanted to work directly with people um, regarding money, you you can really just want to help people and you can really want to serve. And it, the financial services industry covers all aspects of finances. So you can work in marketing, you can work in communications. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you can follow Dana's path um, to become an advisor. 
Um, and then you can actually transition into, you know, a, being a business owner. From my standpoint, Lincoln actually has a diversity recruiter. We have lots of jobs that are open and available, so you can always check out our website. Um, but I think you will be pleasantly surprised to know that there are transferable skills and our industry uh, is actively recruiting. We want more diversity in our industry because we know that if we have that representation, then we can help um, serve our communities more. Great, great. Um, not noticing if there's any questions in the chat, so we're going to try to close out. We want to thank uh, Dana Wilson, uh, founder and CEO of Chip Professional Chip, which um, Kamika Grady, also the Commissioner Omar Sabir. We also want to thank Kelsey Bradbury for her presentation earlier. Uh, for this insightful presentation, once again, when we think about when we think about generational wealth, when we think about financial health in terms of urban communities, it's really about not being afraid to have these conversations around money, not being afraid to have these conversations around politics. And how do we ensure that as African Americans that we participate to this fullest extent, right? We hey, participate and ensure. Uh, sorry, yes. real quick, I, I, I didn't get a chance to say the deadline to election day. I just already want to. Oh yeah, feel free to say that. Someone's listening. Yeah, <laughs> voter registration deadline is October. Uh, the 24th, uh, 11, uh, November the 1st is the vote by mail deadline. If you're planning on voting by mail and November the 8th uh, is actual election day. Uh, about 30% of Philadelphians vote by mail uh, before election day. But listen, we have a very important election. We have the governor on the ballot. We have the United States uh, Senate on the ballot. You know, it's, that's an important election because that can balance the, the balance uh, a power in the United States Senate. So it's very close and there's open seat. And I, I can guarantee you uh, with the shorty as we sitting here, that our quality of life will change overnight depending on who wins the governor's seat in Pennsylvania. So it's a decision that we have to uh, make and can uh, consider. And philadelphiavotes.com is our website. Uh, any way that we could be assistant uh, to you, let me know. Definitely. Um, yeah, so when we think about, it's important when we think about, um, once again, uh, understanding deadlines, uh, we ask you all to look in the chat and actually see a quick survey from um, Urban League and like Financial. We want to know how well this conversation was, does this conversation resonate with you? So as we continue to think about future presentations, we want to make sure that um, we are building our content in a way that speaks to what you are looking for. So if you can quickly fill out the survey that's in the chat so that we can get that insight. So once again, we want to thank um, Dana Wilson. Um, we want to thank Kamika Grady. We want to thank Commissioner Omar Sabir. We also want to thank Kelsey Bradbury. We want to thank all our partners, uh, Next Philadelphia, uh, Chip Professionals, Urban League Guild, and more. And then of course, we want to thank Lincoln Financial for joining us in this conversation to make sure that we have in this holiday season, make sure that we're not losing sight as to the mission and purpose of Juneteenth to ensure that um, we are thinking about generational wealth and we are thinking about uh, ensuring that our community is maximizing its potential and, and achieving the dreams and goals that they set for themselves. So thank you once again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone.